Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Angie Speaks. I'd first of all like to say a huge thanks to all the new subscribers, to the new Patreons and to all the people who shared the videos around. The channel is growing much more rapidly than I anticipated. Um, I would also like to say a huge thanks to Peter Coffin, the Peter Coffin, for being a huge supporter of this channel and using his platform to give it a boost. I couldn't thank you enough and I'm super, super grateful. Um, I'd also like to announce that at the end of the month, I'm going to be doing a Q&A video in celebration. Hopefully by then I will have a thousand subscribers. Um, Patreons will be getting first priority obviously for questions so if you would like to leave a question hopefully I'll get to it so feel free to leave a question in the doobly comment section below. So today I'm going to be talking about Dadaism which is one of my favourite artistic movements and it's links to leftist politics. So stick around and hopefully you'll enjoy what comes next. Dadaism was an art movement that arose in response to the horrors of the First World War. The movement was cultivated around a rejection of the ideals and societal movements that led towards this catastrophe. World War I was an incredibly traumatising period of human history because it occurred during a period of unprecedented mass industrialization and sweeping societal change. The mechanisms of industrialization also created new technologies for warfare that devastated and caused untold misery and bloodshed in its wake. Due to the boom of technological advancements and the rise of industry, nation states were able to create and maintain large armies, navies and air forces. Rapid fire weapons, chemical warfare, Powerful bombs and newly available weapons of war created untold destruction, causing around 41 million casualties. Historians agree that World War I was one of the most deadliest conflicts in human history. The Dadaist movement was centered in Zurich in 1918. However, there were collectives of Dadaists around other parts of Europe and America during this period. Some of the most famous Dadaists included André Breton, Hugo Ball, Tristan Zara, Francis Picabia and Marcel Duchamp. The horrors of the First World War exposed the glaring contradictions within Western society at the time. The unprecedented amount of bloodshed and corruption shattered the once lofty ideals that dwelled within the Western imagination. This was the beginning of the fall of the modernist narratives and the beginning of the rise of postmodernism. There were general feelings of disgust, shame, anger, and mistrust, and the Dadaists responded to this by completely rejecting all notions of meaning within their art. Dadaism was an anti-art movement that thrived on contradictions. It both hated the world and wanted to save it at the same time. The Dadaists were also extremely suspicious of reason and logic. They saw the machinery and scientific achievements of mankind as trivial and embraced the nonsense and the illogical side of the human mind that dwelled within the unconscious. This is where they believed truth dwelled. After all, the machinery and logic of man only served to create more misery and death in their eyes. Dada was both a creative and destructive force. It was a concealer and revealer of truth. It reintroduced the archetype of the trickster into the creative imagination. Dada embraces chaos and abhors order. Chance is also a huge element of Dadaist art, and the Dadaists believed that introducing chance as a variable allowed room for the unconscious mind to speak and reveal truth. There were also elements of humour within Dadaism because it was a form of art that fully embraced the absurd, subversion, contradictions, and madness. Most importantly, it had an ethos of not taking itself too seriously. One of the most famous Dadaist works of art that I'm sure all of you guys have seen at some point 
is Marcel Duchamp's fountain piece. Duchamp worked with found items and he decided to display a found urinal unit as art. This was known as the urinal heresy and it caused controversy within the art world because it was seen as an insult to the very medium itself. This intentional subversion became one of the most iconic Dadaist achievements. Francis Picabia's Dadaist satirical magazine, 391, took the art world by storm as he introduced nonsense and absurdity to the medium. The rigidity of the format was subverted by Picabia's Dadaist sensibilities and his art opened up new possibilities and dimensions within the magazine format. Dadaist principles were not only limited to fine art, they were also employed by poets, musicians, comedians and performers, filmmakers, writers, and almost all other creative and intellectual pursuits. The Dadaist manifesto railed against ideals and meaning and embraced chaos and absurdity as a tool to reveal the truth about society and human nature. In 1918, the Dadaist movement moved away from Zurich and became centered in Berlin. This is when the movement became explicitly political. The Berlin movement began during the time when Germany was suffering the deepest in the post-war depression period. The economic turmoil, the collapse of the Kaiser's government, and the slow creep of fascism created fertile soil for resistance and discontent. Dadaism coupled with radical communism and the Dadaist Central Revolutionary Council was formed by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. They attempted to create an international union of intellectual and creative people under the banner of radical communism. They believed a communist society would allow artists and intellectuals the freedom to pursue their artistic and creative ambition while still being able to live a decent quality of life. They hated the commodification of artistic expression and the role of capitalism within the art world. Dadaism became a revolutionary weapon against capitalism during this time. Revolutionary Dadaists rejected the apathy that had taken hold of their society during this time. And they also rejected the idea of the passive search for a soul. They believed that the only way the soul could reveal itself was through direct action. This thought process was heavily influenced by their leftist beliefs. Dadaism was a chaotic force that challenged cultural conditioning and peeled back the layers of false pretenses in order to expose the core of society to the public imagination. A popular mode of Dadaist art was photo montage. This form of art repurposed and recreated images that were originally used for capitalist advertisements and synthesized them into compelling psychological dramas that revealed truths about culture and the human imagination. Dadaists also repurposed junk and items that were considered superfluous to capital. They recreated the junk of the industrial period and imbued these discarded items with a sense of beauty and purpose. When asked if their work could even be considered art, Dadaists believed that the answer to this question depended upon whether the future belonged to the working class. In the 1920s, Dadaism began to transform into Surrealism, and many of the original Dadaist artists moved into the Surrealism movement. Surrealism was much more concerned with the unconscious mind and drew heavy influences from psychologists like Freud and Jung. Surrealism was also a reaction against common sense and logic. It valued free association, chance, and used these tools as a method for the unconscious mind to assert itself, free from reason and aesthetic preoccupations. The Surrealists believed that the ills of society were caused by the suppression of the unconscious mind, and they attempted to bring about a rebirth of the imagination. This new ethos 
alienated the Surrealists from the revolutionary communists. Because the communists saw this new preoccupation with psychological matters as bourgeois. André Breton, a famous Surrealist, applied for membership within the French Communist Party, but was rejected several times. The decision of the French Communist sparked an incredibly interesting debate about the role of art in revolutionary politics. André believed that art would disqualify itself if it was to submit to outside orders or fill the ranks of any movement that wished to use art to achieve short-term pragmatic ends. He believed that political movements could not improve people's conditions if they did not equally take into account people's subjective needs and not only the material ones. He believed that if communist movements ignored people's subjective needs in favour of their material needs, it would only serve to create new forms of alienation. The communists, on the other hand, were only interested in a proletarian art that would portray the proletarian life and proletarian aspirations. They hated the bourgeois art world and believed that it was the job of artists to create new visions of the future and further the aims of communism. Of course we regret the public treatment of our work. Of course, we do not wish for their patronage. Perhaps it is true that we are wild beasts in a cage, but that does not make us wild beasts any the less. You seem to be saying, on the one hand, that we should create propaganda for immediate consumption by the masses. Against this, we say that any revolutionary message that is embodied in a conservative form cannot have a revolutionary effect. And on the other hand, you demand that the mind and imagination must abdicate until the revolution has been accomplished. And against this we would say that even if our work does not immediately help to precipitate the revolution, the job of interpreting man's condition is indispensable to building the post-revolutionary world. Every mistake in the interpretation of man involves a mistake in understanding the universe and becomes an obstacle to its transformation. I personally side with André Breton, and I believe that his position is the correct one, but I do definitely sympathise with some of the concerns that the Communist Party had at the time. The Communists were fighting a battle against capitalism, and they were interested in a utilitarian art that served a set purpose. André, on the other hand, understood that art serves a higher purpose that fulfills the abstract spiritual needs within human nature that cannot be quantified by its material merit. André Bresson was a communist, but he was incredibly critical about how communist parties viewed the role of art. There are many lessons that modern leftist movements can learn from movements of the past like Surrealism and Dadaism. And there are even whisperings of Dada within our culture today. I personally believe that the most important question for us to analyse is the role of art within revolutionary movements. The radical leftist movements of the past failed to fully integrate and understand these potent artistic forces and they wished to only harness them for their own ends. They believed that the material conditions of humans were more important than the subjective needs of humans, like meaning, beauty, resonance, connection, and all the abstract and unquantifiable essences that make up life. The rift caused by this disagreement alienated artists from leftist movements and created room for suspicion and discontent. I believe that this is a mistake that radical movements of today cannot afford to make. I believe that to create a truly subversive culture, we must pay keen attention to the subjective needs that the material circumstances under capitalism fail to address. These days, Dadaism and Surrealism are still potent weapons that artists consciously and subconsciously employ to expose truths about society without appearing preachy or moralistic.
These days, dogmatism and didactic edicts are usually swiftly rejected by the public. And the only way to really get a point across is to do so in an unexpected and refreshing way. Absurdist comedy has become a trend once again across the radical and liberal left. And the same tactics are used to reveal the absurd structure of our modern culture. From Andy Kaufman to Tom Green to Tim and Eric and David Cross and even down to Donald Glover and his use of these tactics in his TV series Atlanta and the music video This Is America, exploring the absurdity of black existence in the United States and revealing uncomfortable truths about black life and white racism. A loose example of modern Dadaism is Adult Swim's Eric Andre show. The Eric Andre show is a kind of anti-talk show talk show in which Eric completely subverts the beloved cozy format of the American style late night TV show by introducing madness, chaos and unexpected variables. By doing this he exposes the hollowness of the format and the industry's tendency to create fluff and capitulate to the celebrity-obsessed culture. Eric even uses Dadaist comedy techniques to make political points by catching his guests off guard and exposing their ignorance about certain topics. Uh, do you think Margaret Thatcher had girl power? Yes, of course. Do you think she effectively utilized girl power by funneling money to illegal paramilitary death squads in Northern Ireland? I don't know about that. I believe that there's a lot of potential for artists within leftist spheres to explore these techniques and ideas within this new strange terrain that we find ourselves in. We all have material and subjective needs, and art can be a force that changes society and the way we think without necessarily becoming propaganda. So thanks for tuning in to another episode of Angie Speaks, and I really, really hope that you guys enjoyed this episode. I'd like to say a special thank you to my Patreons, whose name you'll see at the end in the credits of this video. And if you would like to become a Patreon um, and get access to all kinds of rewards and exclusive content and early content, uh, please consider donating to my Patreon today. It definitely helps me put more time into what I'm doing. Uh, thank you guys so much again for tuning in and I shall see you later.